Hi, I'm Dina Goldberg, a board-certified genetic counselor specializing in cancer genetics, also known as Dina DNA. And I am Sophia Alexandra, aka The Sophia, a comedian, writer, and podcaster, and breast cancer survivor, not to brag. <laughs> if cancer is listening, this is not a challenge. So today we're going to talk about breast cancer awareness. Sophia, as a breast cancer survivor, what does breast cancer awareness mean to you? Well, um, to be honest with you, Dina, not a hell whole of a lot because the way that this is like marketed for the month of October is let's slap a pink ribbon on everything and call it a day. And no one even knows when they buy the breast cancer pink ribbon products that there's generally a cap that the corporation has for how much money they're gonna give and how it's generally a very tiny, tiny percentage of the products. This is known as pink washing. We've done a really poor job as a culture, making it actually a real thing. For example, in movies and TV, anytime you see anyone that has breast cancer, it's as a flashback and it's like a mom who is bald and she's like the story for why like Julia Stiles needs to dance in The Last Dance. <laughs> I would really love for it to reflect to what it actually is, which would really be awareness. And nowadays, most women survive breast cancer. So I don't want to see the awareness that has been pounded into us of like the bald woman with the schmata and the sadness. Yes, that's a part of it, but also, hey, I am also a face of breast cancer. So can we see some of that shit? <laughs> She's like, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> and Dina, can you tell me what breast cancer awareness means to you? I think breast cancer awareness is not just to be aware of breast cancer in general, but to be aware of our own risk for breast cancer because not everyone's is the same. And there are a lot of tools for us to really figure out what our risk is and how to lower that risk, like knowing your family history and doing something like genetic testing or running a risk model. That's a super powerful tool. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think. So Sophia, what is something that you learned on your journey that you didn't know before having breast cancer? Well, Dina, I don't know if anyone's seen cancer patients or just anybody have a scar here or here like mine. That is a chemo port. If you have chemotherapy and enough sessions, instead of just like constantly putting new needles in you, they'll just install a chemo port which is a three hour surgery, and then they will be able to plug in the line for chemo right into here. So one thing that people don't know is uh, you can ask for your chemo port to be installed in your arm instead of in your chest, which a lot of people like me prefer because aesthetically pleasing, and it's not constantly reminding you that you went through cancer every time you look in the mirror, which I really prefer. A little interesting fact, the reason that arm port started is because Actors could not get insured in Hollywood if they had signs that they were going through cancer treatment. So it was a lot easier to conceal if surgeons put it in here. So even though you're not Paul Newman or whatever a contemporary actor is, you can still ask for this. I think that's really important, not just for those going through breast cancer, but also through any cancer that involves chemotherapy. So if you're somebody who does need to have chemotherapy and you haven't had a port placed, you should talk to your doctor about some of your options for where it can be placed. Tell them Sophia sent you. <laughs> I love to talk about advocating for yourself as a patient. What was your most powerful moment of self-advocacy as a breast cancer patient? I would have to say it is when I was starting radiation. And when you come in for your first appointment for them to just like make sure they know how and where to put the stuff. They generally at that time will ask you if they can tattoo a dot in between your boobs so that they can like help themselves figure out how to put the thing in every time you come in for radiation. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean tattoo a dot? I'm like, can't you just like draw it on? And they're like, no, you're gonna be coming back here every day for like a month. And I'm like, okay, well, can you use a permanent marker? And they're like, no, that's crazy. What if it gets erased in the shower? And I'm like, okay, well, how long does it take for you to draw it on? And they're like, it's a crazy amount of time. And I was like, how much? And they're like, 10 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, so your ass was gonna permanently tattoo me for 10 minutes? No. 
So guess what? They did not tattoo me and it took actually less than 10 minutes to draw the dot on every time. It was probably around five at most. If you don't ask, you would have never known that. For me, so many things in my body got disfigured in a way that I could not be in charge of. It was really a huge amount of power and strength to be able to decide, actually, this is one thing I don't need to have. That's a permanent alteration that you're offering me. And I'm just happy to pass that on. I'm really glad you shared that. And I think it will empower a lot of people to advocate for yourself and not get tattooed if that's not what you want. Totally. How do you think your experience as a breast cancer patient differed because you were diagnosed in your early 30s? Well, I think no one wants to believe that a woman at 33 has breast cancer. So when I found a lump in my breast and I came to my OBGYN, he literally printed out a page of like a textbook and circled the part that I was and he was like, see, this is what your risk is. And it was like a very negligible percentage amount, like a laughable one. And I kept that piece of paper because looking back at it, it's hilarious because I absolutely did have breast cancer. <laughs> and if I did not insist on going further and getting an ultrasound and all that stuff, because my grandma happened to die from uh, breast cancer, then they would not have pursued it. Even the first ultrasound technician said, well, you're too young. I mean, this looks slightly suspicious, but like I would normally just be like, let's just move on, you're fine. But because your grandma, uh, let's do this. And you really don't want your health care decisions to be left to a, uh, <laughs> you know, that's all. No, you don't. And let me just say that that negligible risk that they quoted you, was only based on your age. And there's a lot of other tools and factors that we look at when we're looking at someone's risk. So as a genetic counselor who works with a lot of people with hereditary cancer syndromes, my patients are often very young when they're diagnosed with cancer and they all tell me a very similar story that their doctors didn't believe that they could have it because they were so young unless they already knew they had a cancer syndrome. So when you already have a diagnosis of a cancer syndrome, you do get taken more seriously and you get that screening offered at an earlier age and more frequent. So if you have a family history of early cancer or just cancer at all, or you are worried about a lump or a bump somewhere in your body, don't take no for an answer just because you're young. Always get that checked out because you know your body best. So Sophia, as a breast cancer survivor, did you know about BRCA or the BRCA test before your diagnosis or did that lead you to getting diagnosed? Great question. So I, like a lot of people, read the Angelina Jolie article about the BRCA test and I got it done and I was negative and I was so happy and was celebrating. And then two months later, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's because it turns out BRCA is really not all that you need. Exactly. So it used to be that BRCA or the BRCA genes were the only genes tested in those who had breast cancer or strong family history of it. But now we know of over 20 different genes that are associated with breast cancer, either a high risk or a moderate increased risk. And there are over 100 genes we know of that are associated with different types of cancers. And we're learning more and more about these genes every day. So if you have only had BRCA1 and 2 tested, you need to go and get update testing to make sure that you have had the comprehensive test that is now the standard of care. I know a lot of people have had this question, but what is a good way for someone to support someone else who is going through their cancer journey? A really good tip is to not make the person going through cancer do extra work. So even something that I know is coming from a really good place and from a place where the where you want to help if you hit the person who's going through treatment up and you're like, hey, let me know if I can do anything for you or like, let me know how I can help. That to them is like another assignment. They have so many doctor's appointments, so many pills, so many things to take care of that you being like, hey, hit me up if you need anything is like just another thing on a list. If I can recommend instead of that to ask them, hey, when are your chemo dates? My friend Lee did this really beautiful thing where he put all of the chemo dates into his calendar. And then anytime I would go through chemo, he would come to my house and drop off a pie that he made outside my door and leave. 
He would never knock on the door. He would never try to talk to me because he knew I was recovering and was like deeply not well. But just knowing that someone cared enough and th was thoughtful enough to do something like that was really beautiful. So if there's anything like that that you can take upon yourself without asking the other person what you can do for them, that's really a huge gift that they would really, really appreciate. I think that is amazing advice. And I also think that it is not only relevant for those going through cancer, but also chronic disease, fertility struggles, anyone getting a, a procedure or surgery as well. I hope that this helps somebody who's watching. Me too. Yay. You were sharing with me earlier about a tool that you had when people were asking you how you were doing and a million questions about your diagnosis. Yeah, so as soon as I got diagnosed and I knew that I would be public about it because um, I am, you know, uh, a comedian and a writer and I wanted to be able to process my experience through those lenses and I did not want to tell a million people over and over and over again what was going on with me and all of the details. I decided to write a Tumblr post on all of the questions that people might have about like, how long is your treatment? What kind of treatment? What's the stage? What kind of cancer? What can we do to help? What are you going to need from us? That kind of stuff. So I just put it all in one Tumblr post and then I posted the link on my social media. When anyone would reach out to me and ask me any questions, I just would send them that link because it took a lot of work off my plate, I have to say. Yeah, I'm sure. This is a really good tip, not just for cancer, but for anybody going through any major health issues where it's emotionally very tolling to have to explain it over and over. So I could see this being a really good tool to send someone a link when you are asked this over and over. Totally. And I think to shed a little bit of light on it for people who have not gone through an illness or a fertility thing, the reason that it's so hard to repeat it isn't just because it's like, oh, it's so annoying, which like that's kind of a part of it. But the biggest part of it is that you're watching somebody emotionally react to something that you're telling them that's sad. So and you're re-experiencing it over and over again. It's not a toll that you feel like you ought to be taking. And also it makes you feel like you're now responsible for consoling them about your own bad news, right? Exactly. So that's a really great tip for y'all if you feel comfortable sharing publicly about what you're going through. I know as a comedian, you travel a lot and you also just love to travel in general. So what travel hacks do you have for somebody going through cancer? Okay, my cheap ass obviously was flying Southwest a lot, you know, to do comedy festivals and gigs and whatever. And you know how Southwest makes you like, you know, you have to set an alarm 24 hours beforehand so you can like mm -hmm. be part of like group A. So here's the thing, you don't need to do that if you're actually someone who's going through treatment. You can just like, come there when it's your time to fly you go up to the desk before you board and you say hey i am a cancer patient and i don't think i needed to do this but i for some reason felt like they would not believe me i was like hey i'm a cancer patient i was like just pointing at my chemo port i'm like this is my chemo port i'm like probably did not need to do that but i was like hey i'm a breast cancer patient uh and they wouldn't even ask you to say anything else they would just give you a boarding pass so you could board early, like before anybody else, which at that point was really huge for me because I just had a lumpectomy and people like bumping against my breast would have been a lot. I also couldn't really like carry things as well or do anything that was like strenuous in any way. So just FYI, you know, you can ask for that. You can tell your airline that's what's happening and they will make sure that you get on board early. Do you think that would work for other airlines too? I mean, I think you'd be have, have to be pretty heartless <laughs> to just be like, no, why don't you get in the back where the farts are? <laughs> if you're listening, Delta, American Airlines, United, whatever, I'm not going to ask anything of spirit because... <laughs> you have other things to fix. But just I, FYI, it would be terrible if you made cancer patients do that. And I think that's also helpful for people not just going through cancer, but those who have different disabilities, especially since sometimes disabilities are invisible. Exactly. When we talk about advocating for ourselves, it's not just in the healthcare space. It's anywhere in life, and that includes when you travel and when you make plans with airlines. So if you have any sort of disability or you are a cancer patient, it's worth 
checking out to see if you can get that extra help. And if you're tired because you're going through treatment and you can't stand while you board and stuff, that is absolutely a time that they can put you in a wheelchair and help out with that. So don't be shy. I know it feels weird to ask for that probably for the first time if you're mm -hmm. not used to it, but just uh, remember that your number one goal is to get to where you're going safely and easily and with the least amount of hassle.